What's up, Degenerates? It's the Disc Golf World. I'm Jefferson. Alongside me, as always, the one with all the holes in his game, Swiss Cheese. And we're recapping everything you need to know from round two of the sixth annual Persimmon Ridge Resort. With round two started and the wind gusts coming a bit faster, just not as quick as some of these greens. Before Swiss gets into the recap, I want to address a quick topic we've been hearing on the course that the average viewer at home may not realize watching the coverage. The professionals have been hyping up the Persimmon Ridge property, rightfully so I should add, claiming that it's ready for a DGPT event. And at first glance, it's hard to argue, but we gotta talk about the greens first. Drew Gibson made this comment at the press conference that first brought my attention to this. The only thing that I looked around and saw that I thought could be better was like just cleaning up some of the greens. I'm like a big stickler on not liking, you know, being 18 feet away and literally having no way to make it in the hole. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if we were able to like, you know, they, they own this property. If they wanted to cut up the limbs, they literally could. You know, there's no one to tell them, oh, you can't do this or you can't do that. So a hole that we've heard constantly throughout the weekend is hole 15 and they're basically not being a green. As Drew said, when you work so hard to get yourself down for a putt over 700 feet, you like to have a clean shot at birdie without too much obstruction in your way. Certain holes make it tricky to do that and sometimes making 20 footers difficult with branches right in your face. There needs to be a challenge, but at some point, it's already hard enough to hit a 30 foot putt. I know I'd probably miss. Another topic I heard specifically surrounding hole 17 was green location. When majority of players are being forced to lay up since a missed putt would most likely result in two more strokes at the very least. I see the argument of this being a bad hole, but at the same time, how many 348 foot hyzers on tour wouldn't be talked down upon? At the very least, there's some sort of challenge in having to land in the very forgiving front half of that green. Sure, you're still left with the decision whether to run it or not, but flat ground in circle one sounds fair enough to me. The hole still played under par for the day and brought plenty of bogeys, including many doubles as well. Pair that with the beast that is hole 18 and we'll have a fun finish tomorrow. I've only heard good things about 18, but I don't know if I'll be able to say the same after today. Coming in at the most difficult hole by far, playing over a stroke and a half over par. Only four players were able to secure the birdie, but more impressively, three players took over a double digit score on the hole. On that note, Swiss hit the people with the FPO. The wind wrecked havoc on the scores today for the FPO, that of course, with the exception of Owen Scoggins and Kristen Tatar. Delivering on all the fans' expectations in a first-time A-tier and at Persimmon Ridge makes it all the more unique. Gone are all the shops, the production, and the stuffiness a tour stop can bring. Here, where the players outnumber the fans, it's about disc golf and the companionships the sport builds. Not to sound spoiled, but to witness this level of play on this track in person while being the closest to the action on and off the course makes it one of the better stops we've ever made. With these talents in this course, the amount of fans spectating doesn't matter. These two zeroed in on the course and the conditions and looked to break it. The two shot better than yesterday in windier conditions, scored the same amount of birdies on the day, shot over a thousand rated, decimated the remainder of the field, and left the course tied to do it all over again on Championship Sunday. Own fueled on last night's beer and barbecue, came in with a stroke advantage and extended that lead on the first hole with a birdie to Tatar's par. Wouldn't be long till Tatar got that stroke back a mere four holes later. Match each other stroke for stroke until 9, where the only blemish between the two would be the deciding factor on the day. 9, the second hardest hole on the course, saw no birdies on the day and would be Owen's undoing as she took the bogey and lost her lead to Tatar. Owen did all she could to regain the advantage, going 4 down on the very next 4 holes, 3 of which were averaging over par. For any other player not named Tatar, it would have been enough. Against Tatar, it only gained her a single stroke, however, and she would lose it again three holes later. And to finish it off, and in epic fashion, both finished with a birdie on 17, the only two to score that on the day, and with this wind, par was good enough on 18. With the stage set, the only concern will be the conditions, with the exception to Own, who's not only missing her caddy, but her husband on this stretch. Unfortunately, he have to go back and do a lot of meeting. It's, it's very sad for me to, to don't have him with me uh, the whole week. Uh, but you know what? You're going to be tough when you live the life like this. If you decide to be this kind of, this is your job, you know, you have to be tough. And I mean, you know, my heart's with him. His heart with me. So it's, it's, it's good. Do you think it changes your game at all, or are you pretty much the same out there? Uh, pretty much the same, because even his caddy for me, his, his game is kind of a like very safe game. He's, he's always tell me to lay up. He said, don't, don't, 
don't party, lay up, don't throw, whatever. I, I never listen to him. <laughs> Most of the time, I'm not listen. I'm just like, because my game, my game is very aggressive, and he's like very like safe player. But some, like here and there, I listen to him, you know, but uh, only one thing I'm gonna missing a lot is emotional um, supporter, because he is my rock, like, whatever, I'm high or low in my feeling, bad shot here and there. When I look at his face, I know it's, um, everything gonna be okay. As for the conditions, they look to be the best of the three days. Cat Merch in her home state is currently in third place, 11 strokes back, but in a battle for a podium spot. Currently three under for the tournament, she needs to clean up her bogeys, especially on 18. But with the best conditions and her distance, she will for sure put on a show, or at the very least, have one of those off-the-wall conversations about hiding bodies. Kona Montgomery, despite what she said in the presser, has made another lead card and currently only a stroke behind Merch for a third place finish, which is not only impressive, but a solid stepping stone and an accomplishment for her returning season. I'm like 85. Um, I'm still working through some scar tissue in my shoulder and my neck. Um, but other than that, uh, my body's feeling great. I'm throwing without um, pain, which is the first time in a long time. And uh, I also don't have some of those other contributors that I had uh, in years past. So it's been really awesome. Over on the MPO side, Andrew Marwi would find himself extending his lead by three strokes. After taking the par on one, he'd get his round going on the second hole. Although he would go on a stretch for par, based on the scoring today, he'd be just fine. The hot round would only be an eight under, and I say that lightly as eight down at this track is still an impressive feat. I mean, I was looking for par at best when we play on Monday. We'll get to see how Swiss's holes hold up at Persimmon. Nathan Queen would secure 10 birdies in the round, but would get an unfortunate bogey on the hard hole 8. Still blows my mind there's an 1,000 foot par 4 out there. Marweed would finish his front 9, 4 under, but would par holes 10 through 14 until getting the birdie on 15 and his last one coming on hole 17. That's what happens when you land on the good side of the basket. Drew Gibson moved up 2 spots in 2nd place after a 6 under round. He didn't get his round going until late as he finished the front 9 even. Needing to pick it up quickly, he would get the must-get birdie on 10, followed up with a crazy eagle on the 827-foot par 5, soaring right by that bird. Would keep it going on hole 12 and 13. Back home, we call that a train. Drew would go 5 down through 4 holes on that stretch, getting his final birdie on the last hole, securing a solid 6 under for the day. Drew would suffer the fate of a few bad breaks from rollaways into weird spots to off-the-course distractions. Oh yeah, and layups. Something our friend Tomas knows too much of. Even with that and a bogey, he would only be three back to the lead. And on this track, it's just one bad hole away. Paul Kranz also is tied for second place at 13 under. Getting a couple quick birdies early on holes 2 and 3, he would start off in the right direction. He would get the birdie on the must-get hole 5. Unfortunately, he would find a stretch of three bogeys in holes 8, 9, and 10, setting him back to even for the round. Not wanting all that work to go to waste, he would recover on the rest of the back half. Gets the birdie on 11 to get the good feelings rolling and would manage his way into four more birdies. Finishing his round 5 under and still in position of a share of second place. Luke Sampson and Raven Newsom would jump up 3 spots into 4th place with Big Germ at 12 under. Luke would start the first 8 holes 4 under par and looking good. He would find his first bit of trouble on hole 9. He would go OB on his approach which set him up for this long shot into the green. You might be confused on why he's so much further back than his lie. And no, it's not a footfall. But you are actually allowed to go as far straight back from the basket as you want from your lie when going out of bounds. Luke apparently needed some room, deciding to walk this one out for the hyzer, which ended up inside the circle looking like he would save the par. Well, it looked that way at least. It wouldn't take him long to get that stroke back, going back-to-back -back birdies on 11 and 12. He slowed down from there, but after a birdie on 17, he would finish his round 6 under for the day and rounding out tomorrow's lead card. Raven would take his time warming up, parring the first 3 holes until he found a bogey on hole 4. He would come back with birdies in the next 2 holes, putting himself 1 under, and he stayed that way until hole 11, which started a run of 3 birdies, and he would finish with 2 more for a 6 down for the round. Can't forget Big Germ, who would be the last person tied in 4th place. He would get 7 birdies on the day, but with 2 bogeys, would find himself settling with a 5 under. And now here are some tournament quick hitters. Thomas Rouse and Adrian Chevalier. Yeah, those are definitely not pronounced right. Well, they both eagled hole 11, so that's cool, so make sure to remember the names. Joey Buckets must have lost a bet to Braden Sides. Loser must have had to be on Drew's bag. Noah Fivesh out here grinding putts and victory royales. 
Thanks to Andrew Fish, we get to see Cole Montgomery win Best Dressed Middle Schooler. Get that man's his chocolate milk. Kevin Jones pulls the classic dry shave in the parking lot before his round. And that's everything you need to know from round two of the sixth annual Persimmon Ridge Retreat. If you enjoyed, make sure to drop a like and subscribe. It's the easiest way to support the channel. And shout out to all our members on Patreon and YouTube. Oh, and if you want to know what the future for the Disc Golf Pro Tour looks like, check out the video right here.